Thank you. So, um, well, that's uh, very happy to be here, and thank the organizers for the opportunity. I need to say that um, I meet uh, uh, Wellington uh, in my uh, my first time in my master degree in, at IMPA, but I already knew his book when I was in the undergraduation. I have a professor that uh, doesn't, didn't work in dynamic system, but uh, he has a lot, lot of books on dynamic system. He was fascinated by this. And he, he has uh, many books, Devon A book and uh, so, on, so on and so forth. But he has one book of, uh, of, uh, of uh, <coughs> one to the Mellow and Sebastian Van String on one dimensional dynamics. And on the time, uh, there are many vulgarization uh, articles about universality in chaos, and uh, was fascinated by this. And I saw that the last chapter was exactly about helomalization theory, and was fascinated by this uh, subject. And uh, I tried to understand in my uh, summer time. <laughs> I tried to read the last chapter. I was not able to read it. I tried to read the first chapter that was about circle diffeomorphisms and things like that. I didn't understand anything. so. I, <laughs> I, I decided that I need to go to IMPA to um, learn more about these things. And uh, the rest is, uh, was very happy to this, with this uh, decision. So I didn't bring a gift to Wellington, but I, I thought to bring this that was a brand of rice, call it uh, trivial, but was too big to bring. It's like five kilograms, so I didn't bring. But half birthday, Wellington. So, um, and this picture is interesting because, uh, well, we have also uh, the students of Wellington, uh, except Gaspar Ruiz, and uh, uh, Palis and Liubich, and this talk is, um, is related with the work of these three uh, researchers. So, I'm going to talk about multimodal helomalization with bounded combinatorial. So first, I need to explain to you what's anomalization. Where well, I saw many uh, talks on anomalization, many kinds of uh, branches of one-dimensional dynamics. We are going to see more this afternoon, and, and uh, after this talk, actually, and in this afternoon. So in my setting, I'm working with uh, anomalization theory. So I gave this talk many times, actually. But uh, uh, now I have the papers, so you can check the papers and, uh, on the archives. So uh, what is helomalization in my setting? I'm working with multimodal maps, so maps with many critical points. And for reasons that I'm not going to explain, to understand infinite helomalizable maps with uh, many critical points is enough to study compositions of unimodal maps. So I have a map like this defining three intervals, disjoint intervals, and uh, this uh, map permutates these intervals, in this case three, and in which one of these intervals the map is just a unimodal map. You have just one critical point. So I say that this map is anomalizable if I can find some set, subset of intervals, a union of a finite number of intervals, and these intervals are permuted by the dynamics of, map, of the map. For instance, in this case, you have nine intervals, and they're permuted by the dynamics. And all the critical points, as you can see, uh, belongs to one of, these, of those intervals. So what you can do in this setting, so if you have this situation, you can define the helomization of this map. And the helomization of this map is just the following. You normalize the size of the intervals that contains the critical points to the original size by a fine conjugacy. And you consider iterations, iterations of the original map. So in this case, second iteration, second iteration, and fifth iteration, and then you complete the cycle and you normalize to the original size. So when you do that, if you can do that, you get a new map that may be so complicated as the original one. So that's the difficulty in helomalization. That's the difficulty to understand uh, maps that are helomalizable. When you iterate, things doesn't get simpler. So that's maybe that's the difficulty to, to understand helomalization. 
So, and this can happen again and again because this map is again a multimodal map. It may be anomalizable again and again and again, infinitely many times. So it's like one of those uh, Russian dolls, one inside another. So uh, you see smaller and smaller versions of the same thing in the larger size, in the smaller size, the smaller scale. Okay, so uh, if you have a circle of, of intervals that are permuted, you can uh, call it uh, define homomorphization. And in this case, the period of homomorphization is the number of intervals. In this case, it's nine. Okay. Okay, so uh, if the map is infinitely homomorphizable, you have a nested sequence of units of intervals that converges to a counter set. And this counter set is actually the closure of the orbit of the critical points. And you say that the map has bounded combinatorics. If the sequence of consecutive periods, uh, the quotient of the sequence of the consecutive, uh, consecutive periods are uniformly bounded by some constant B. Okay. Uh, there are infinite homological maps that does not have bounded combinatorics, but you are not going to talk about this, uh, in, this in this work. Okay, uh, good. So when you take the intersection of this nested sequence of intervals, uh, nested sequence of uh, unions of intervals, you get a uh, counter set that's the closure, to, closure, uh, the clo closure of the orbit of the critical point, of the critical points. And actually, you can prove that this is a topological, uh, is a measure theoretical attractor. Almost every point converges to this counter set. It's not very fast, but it converts to this counter set. Okay. So, uh, as I told you, to understand this is complicated. This is a complicated dynamic because you have a measured theoretical attractor, but the rate of convergence is not exponential. It's kind of polynomial rate of convergence. So, this is a bad dynamical system. So, what we wanted to, uh, to do is to show that for a generic finite dimensional family of multimodal maps, the set of parameters that has this behavior has zero Lebesgue measure. So um, that implies that this Hushan dolls, at least with bounded combinators, doesn't, doesn't happen very often. So this is a very shy set, it's a very small set. And uh, here generic means in terms of uh, CK topology or real analytic uh, in some real analytic setting too, okay? And uh, this term goes in the direction of works, uh, of work of Lyubich and uh, uh, Avila, Lyubich and, and De Mello and Avila and, and Gugu about generic behavior and the palace conjecture actually. So uh, this setting is in the setting that, okay, maybe you cannot describe most of uh, all dynamical systems, the dynamical, uh, the there are dynamical systems with very complicated dynamics, very bad dynamics, but you can understand maybe most of the dynamical systems uh, in some sense. So let me illustrate what, what I mean by that. I mean that the idea is the following that comes to uh, Komogorov, I think. That's the following. When you do the sum experiment, you can just realize a finite dimensional family of dynamical systems. That's this curve of dynamical systems here. So you have the black, the, the white board is the infinite dimensional space of a dynamical systems. But if you have a experiment, you can just realize finite many, a finite dimensional family of dynamical systems. That is this curve that you see here. So when you adjust these dial controls, you can change the dynamical systems that you can see in this experiment. You have a finite number of dials. So that's the dimension of the family that you can actually realize in this experiment. So when you move this, you move the dynamical system that you can see. So may, maybe this family is very atypical. So maybe this family is difficult to understand. So the idea is the following. The idea is that you can uh, perturb your experiment. So you just uh, do a kick in your experiment. So you do a kick in your experiment and you kick your experiment, uh, the family of dynamical systems that you can actually realize changes. And maybe in this new family, 
you can understand most of the parameters in this finite dimensional form. So that's the idea. That's the idea. And, and that goes uh, from, from Komogorov to uh, uh, lots of developments go, go to these results of Avila, Diuch, and Mello. You have Pallas conjecture, all in this kind of spirit to understand most of the dynamical systems. So how I prove uh, my, uh, the main result? So, okay, I'm not, what I mean by genetic is some genetic, in some Banach space of real analytic functions. So you have, you can consider CK family, so you have some interval. So this, uh, uh, this space, these dynamical systems are defined in the real line. There's some intervals in the real line. So, but uh, just consider real analytic uh, dynamical systems. So you can extend it to some domain, and you can consider CK families from this, uh, say, this square to this uh, real analytic bonding space of functions. And I mean generic in this topology. We could have real analytic topology uh, or finite dimension, finite uh, smoothness topology. Okay. Okay. So there are lots of things that you can say you know about holomorphization theory. Uh, for unimodal maps, you have these uh, works of many people, Dwight Hubbard, Sullivan, McMullen, Lilbert. And uh, for multimodal maps, you'd have this John Hu PhD thesis on the supervision of uh, Dennis Sullivan, my PhD thesis, and, uh, and there are some, uh, some few results, previous results on holomorphization theory. So uh, maybe one of the most important facts about helmization operator is that you have some compactness. So if you iterate, suppose you have a map that you can iterate infinitely many times the helmization operator, so this orbit is pre-compact in some very precise sense, and this is called a complex bound. And that's a very, uh, well, it's a little technical maybe, but it's very important in many results, recent results in, in, in one dimensional dynamics, dynamics of polynomials, for instance. Okay, and uh, another thing that we know is that you pick all the possible, so I said that the orbits of the helmization operator are pre-compact, so you pick, pick all the possible accumulation points of all possible orbits. So this is some omega limit set of helmization operator. This is a compact set, and the dynamics there if you have a bounded combinatorics, it's conjugated with a full shift with finite many symbols, exactly because you have bounded combinatorics in this, in this set. And we know that you have universality. So if you pick any map that's infinitely homologizable, so you can find a special map in this omega limit set that, uh, well, maybe more than one actually, uh, where, uh, the four or orbit are exponentially close to each other. These two guys belong to the same stable manifold of the normalization period. Okay, so these are old facts. I'm not going to uh, talk about this today, how you prove these things. So how I prove the main results? So the first part is complexified normalization operator. Normalization operator, and the way that I describe it, is defined for interval maps. Maps are defined in a uh, finite union of intervals. But actually, you can complexify the operator uh, in the spirit of uh, what Lilbich and uh, 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 Alberto Pinto, Wellington de Mello, and Edson Faria did uh, also for the unimodal setting. So you can see this operator has a no linear complex analytic compact operator in some complex analytic Banach space. So this uh, is directly related with complex bounds. Again, I'm not going to talk about this because it's quite similar to the unimodal map uh, of this uh, setting. The second, uh, maybe the main uh, difficulty is to prove that the dynamics in the omega limit set volumization operator is a hyperbolic dynamics. You have a horseshoe there and, and with a finite many symbols. The dynamics is hyperbolic there. And the third and fourth step is to, to use this hyperbolicity to prove that in the gene generic family, the, inter the parameters that uh, intersect the stable manifolds, the stable lamination of this hyperbolic set has zero Lebesgue measurement. 
So the first step is to prove that if you pick a transversal family to the stable lamination of this hyperbolic set, the intersection uh, has empty interior. And, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about this. And the second step is to prove that this intersection has actually zero Lebesgue measure. And uh, I, I, I could, uh, this is interesting because it's kind of a generalization of Boeing result about hyperbolic sets. We know that if we pick a C2 hyperbolic set in a finite dimensional uh, uh, manifold, a horseshoe, in a finite dimensional manifold, let's say C2, then this set has zero Lebesgue measure. Okay? So there's a classical result of, of Boeing, and it was generalized uh, for some partial hyperbolic settings for Alves, by Alves and Piero. So this is kind of generalizations of these results for infinite dimensional setting. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. So I wanted to concentrate in the second step to prove that the omega limit set of R is hyperbolic. So how you do that? How you prove that something is hyperbolic? So to, to, to talk about this, first I need to talk about what's a quasi-conformal vector field. So a quasi-conformal vector field is a map that has distribution uh, square integrable, locally square integrable distribution of derivatives, and uh, d bar of alpha is bounded on the complex plane. So why these quasi-conformal deformations are important in this setting? Because using that, you can define what Lubitsch called it, uh, horizontal directions, so introduced by Lubitsch in the, to study the unimodal randomization. So you can consider a polynomial-like map that's just a map that maps, well, I'm not going to explain, it's a covering map, critical covering map from some disk to, to some larger disk. And you say that V is horizontal if there is a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies this equation here, okay? So uh, if you consider for every given F, you can consider all the horizontal Direction. So this is a subspace of the space of all possible V's, functions V's. So you, you can see this in the, in the following. So you have a, this infinite dimensional bonic space of a dynamical systems. For every F, you can define this horizontal direction that is a subspace. Uh, uh, so for every F, you have a distribution of a subspaces that are the horizontal directions. And it turns out that these horizontal directions are very important to understand the normalization parameter. And the reason is, uh, well, uh, so that's the, the spirit. Uh, so if you consider all the maps that are topologically conjugate with F, well, this is not exactly the, I'm lying a little bit, this is not exactly the hybrid class, but just to, to be simple. So you consider the topological con uh, maps that are con topological conjugate to F. So this is a manifold. And uh, the horizontal direction is the tangent space of F. So the Liberty did that for, uh, for, for the unimodal setting, okay? I'm not going to give the, the details of that. So that's the spirit. So, uh, but there's another uh, reason why, well, well uh, another way to see that, there's another way to see that, is that if you have a family of deformations of a dynamical system, suppose you have a curve of dynamical systems, all of these maps are topologically conjugate with F naught. So if you differentiate this family of conjugates, suppose you can differentiate this family of conjugacies, HT. So you can differentiate that, not going to give the details, but if you differentiate that and call it this one alpha T, you can see that uh, the derivative of, uh, of the family is related with the derivative of the conjugacy by this equation. So alpha t's, uh, the solutions of that uh, cohomological equation is like the infinitesimal deformations of associated with the family ft at t equals to zero. So, uh, so if you have a solution alpha, if you have a v with a, a solution alpha to this equation, so uh, you see that the family of conjugacy satisfies this differential equation. So the idea is that if you know a lot about alpha, the regularity of alpha, you can see a lot about this flow of conjugacies. So if, for instance, is alpha are quasi-conformal vector fields, you can prove that uh, this flow 
defined by the conjugal cis is a quasi conformal flow, every, uh, a quasi conformal flow. For every t, HT is a quasi conformal map. Cool. So, so that's the, the spirit of this. If you solve this equation, prove that this is very regular, you can prove that the family of conjugal cis very, uh, behaves well with respect to the parameter t. Okay. So uh, well, another way to see it is, again, suppose that you perturb your family of your dynamical system by some TV, and you wanted to know what happens with the iterations. So you iterate the original map any times, the uh, original family any times, and you wanted to know what happens with the, the iterations. So this is going, if you perturb F in direction of V, well, uh, you are going to perturb the iteration in the direction of uh, W, and you wanted to know the relation between W and V. And the relation uh, is complicated. I mean, you can write down explicitly, but it's complicated. But if a V is a horizontal direction, it's very easy. You can just do a formal calculation and verify that W uh, uh, V is related with the same alpha. It satisfies also the cohomological equation, replacing F by the iteration, corresponding iteration. So that's uh, uh, Easy calculation, actually. Okay, so uh, what more? So what's the relation between holomorphization operator and the horizontal directions? Turns out that uh, you can uh, prove that the horizontal directions are preserved by the derivative of the holomorphization operator. So the horizontal directions is an invariant uh, distributions of, of vectors. And you have exponential contraction of the holomorphization operator on this direction. So this horizontal directions belongs to the stable direction of the normalization operator. Okay, so uh, what remains to understand, if you wanted to prove the action of a normalization operator is hyperbolic, you need to prove that there's some, the transversal direction, one way to, uh, uh, you need to prove that transversal direction, the, the direction transversal to the horizontal directions, you have expansion of the normalization operator. So uh, you need to, uh, to understand these transversal directions. So how you prove that something is hyperbolic? Suppose you have a linear map uh, in the finite dimensional vector space like this, and it's hyperbolic. So that means that when you iterate forward some vectors, these vectors grow. So if you pick this black vector here, and you iterate forward, it grows. And uh, well, there are some vectors that do not grow forward, like this blue one. But if you iterate ba ba backwards, it expands too. So uh, except for the zero vector, uh, all the vectors expand either in the future or in the past. So we wanted to, uh, this actually characterize hyperbolic maps. So this is a very easy linear algebra, well, it's linear algebra exercise to prove that a matrix is hyperbolic if only if the only vector that uh, has a bounded orbit between the future and in the, in the past is the zero vector. So that's the characterization of hyperbolic matrix. So I wanted to use a generalization of this for cocycles. So, uh, and fortunately there are some results in the 70s about this. So we have this Sucker and Cell uh, characterization of hyperbolic cocycles. So I'm going to put this setting, but actually I didn't use exactly uh, in this way. But suppose that X is a compact metric space and you have an homeomorphism of X to itself. And suppose that minimal sets are dense. For instance, periodic points are dense. For instance, you have a horseshoe. You have a full, full horseshoe as in your setting. And uh, suppose you have a cocycle. So for every X, you associate an invertible matrix. So you can define this cocycle, and you wanted to know if this cocycle is hyperbolic. And turns out that the same characterization uh, for matrix works in this no autonomous setting. So if you consider uh, this setting, the setting of all vectors in this uh, vector bundle that are, has bounded orbits, so you know that T is hyper, as a hyperbolic cycle if and only if this is just the trivial section, the section of all the zero vectors. So uh, that's a very elegant uh, characterization of a hyperbolicity. And you wanted to use this 
in my setting. The difference now is that in my, my setting, uh, the Helmholtz operator acts in infinite dimensional dynamical space, and this is for finite dimensional cosines. By the way, this holds for every vector bundle. Does does not need to be a trivial vector. Okay, so uh, I wanted to use this in my setting. So what uh, we do is the following. Okay, these horizontal directions, we know what happens. You have contraction of the, the action of the lambdization operator. So you take the quotient of the Banach space by this horizontal direction. When you do that, we know that this horizontal direction has finite codimension. And the, the codimension of this space is the number of critical points involved. For, in, for instance, in my example, the codimension is three. You have three intervals, three critical points. So the codimension of this is three. So when you take the, co uh, the quotient, you get a three-dimensional uh, vector space. And because the action of the normalization operator preserves these horizontal directions, you can take the quotient of the action, and you get a finite dimensional cosine. And uh, another thing that's important is that the action of the normalization operator on the omega limit set is invertible. The normalization operator in general is not invertible, but on the omega limit set is uh, conjugate to a full shift. So it's invertible in that setting. So you can use the result uh, uh, of Sucker and Cell to conclude that if you prove that the sets of the vectors which has four or a bounded four or four or orbit uh, belongs to the horizontal direction. If you prove this, then you prove the homogeneous operator is hyperbolic. So that's the idea, to prove that every vector that satisfies this inequality belongs to the horizontal direction. So that's the main, uh, the key lemma in this uh, approach. So what you do is prove this key lemma. Suppose you have a vector, and when you iterate the, the derivative of the operator, you have a bounded orbit, forward bounded orbit. So you need to prove that there exists a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies this equation. So it belongs to the horizontal direction. So you can forget everything now. So that's the main uh, difficulty, to prove this key lemma. So it's just something in the, in the phase space of F. It's a problem in the phase space of F, actually. And how you solve this problem? To solve this problem, uh, let me show you some simple situations where solve this cohomological equation is quite easy. So suppose you have an expanding map of the circle, for instance. So you can see that if I give you V on the circle, so you can find a solution of this equation simply taking this uh, series. So this series converges because this, is, this is exponentially grows, this uh, denominator grows exponentially, and the numerator is bounded. So this converges to a continuous function, and automatically you can see that satisfies this equation. So when you have expansion, it's very easy to solve this equation. You don't actually need any assumptions about V, okay? The reason by that is because, in this case, you have a strictly stable dynamical system, okay? But uh, in the situation where you have critical points, this series uh, doesn't converge. Actually, you can prove that this, in a typical situation, this uh, diverges for uncountable set of points. So the solution of that is do what, uh, what we call it summation. So you group terms in the series in such a way to get a convergence series. It's like this one. So have one minus one, one minus one. This diverges. But if you group the terms two by two, this converges to zero. So that's the idea here. You replace the original series by a summation of the series, uh, a d dynamically defined summation, to obtain a convergence series. So that's the... Uh, the idea. So suppose that your dynamical system is not uh, expanding, so it, maybe you can find an induction, indu uh, make some induction, and get uh, uh, another iterations of, a dynam of the dynamical system that is expanding. So in such a way to define this induced uh, problem. So you solve this induced problem for this expanding map, and then you prove that the solution is the solution of the original, uh, of the original problem. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what uh, we try to do. Okay, and uh, there's another advantage in your setting because in your setting, the dynamical system is an open dynamical system. It's a polynomial-like map. So you know that most of the points in the phase space actually escape 
and eventually goes to this ring. Okay? So that's the open dynamical system. You have these fundamental rings that helps you to solve the equation. And to do that, uh, we can use uh, okay, let's skip that. the infinitesimal pullback argument. So this argument says the following. If you solve the equation on the frontier of the domain and the orbit of the critical point in the post-critical set, so you can find a solution of the cohomological equation. That's quasi-conformal vector field. So let me explain this uh, in a very simple setting where you don't have critical points. So suppose you have a map like this, a conformal iterated uh, dynamical system. So this goes in a univalent way to this one, and this goes in an univalent way to the red disk. So the problem is I give you some V, and uh, the problem is to find a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies this equation. So what you do is the following. What you do is to solve the equation. Uh, so you de declare that alpha is 0 here, and solve the equation in the frontier of the blue disks. So define it this way. So uh, then you have automatically that alpha satisfies uh, the equation on the frontier of these disks. And then you expand, extend some arbitrary way in this green region, in some smooth way, let's say, to get a quasi-conformal vector field in the green region. And then you extend this to the blue region, define it using the cohomological equation. So you extend and extend again and again and again. So that's basically the infinitesimal pullback argument. You extend the definition more and more. And then you have the counter set in the limit. But in the counter set, you can some, use some limit argument to prove that you, you can extend the solution for, for the counter set. Okay. So now I'm going to explain. So the situation that uh, we have here, you're going to be quite similar to this situation, except that you don't have just a finite number of components. You are going to have a fin an infinite number of connect components in the domain. So let me explain this in my situation. But I wanted to explain this in a simpler situation. That is the peridubling helmization. Because it's easier to explain, it's easier to draw in this, in this setting. So what you do is the following you uh, consider uh, a unimodal map like this. So you have this interval harmonization. This interval is mapped to this one, and these go back to this one. So what you do is restrict f to this little interval here. You take the second, inter second harmonization. So you have a picture. Oh, sorry. This is the first harmonization. And you have the same intervals of the next harmonization. So you restrict the second iteration to the smallest blue interval there. And so on and so forth. When you do that infinitely many times, you have a sequence of branches. And they are converging to the ghost of the critical point. And this map does not have critical points. It's a Markovian map, and actually an expanding map. So it's quite similar to this conformal interrelated dynamical systems that I told you before. Now, the next step is to complexify the problem. So you extend this map to the complex plane. So instead of intervals, you pick disks around these intervals and uh, cover these intervals. So this is going to be the domains of the complex induced map. And then these intervals are mapped to these pink disks in this way. So the second iteration maps this one to this, and the fourth iteration maps this one to this, and so on and so forth. So this is almost like in the uh, conformal iterated situation, except that the domains touch each to other. So you just reduce the intervals a little bit to get a picture like this. So that's the induced map. This is expanding, univalent, is perfect, except that you have infinite many domains. And then you try to solve the cohomological equation for this induced problem and go back and prove that this is a solution to original dynamical uh, original problem. So uh, okay, this is going to get a little scary now. So um, the idea is to find a solution for this induced problem. So you replace f by some iteration of the map, okay? some iteration of the map. 
and you try to find alpha that satisfies this for the induced problem. So uh, the idea is the following. So you try to, so you have this uh, left side of this equation. You ne we need to analyze what this is. So you replace, you try to study this. So what you see is that this has two components. The first component depends only on the interactions of V by the derivative of the operator. And this is bounded for every n. So this is kind of wonderful. This is the first part is kind of wonderful. The second part actually has a simpler structure, but it's more difficult to deal with. So the second part, you have the derivative of the induced dynamical system, and you have these beta ends. And these beta ends are actually just conformal uh, vector fields. So there's really simple vector fields. But they, they depend on n, and the, the behavior is kind of uh, complicated. So what you do, because this is a linear problem, you solve the cohomological equation for the first part, and then you solve the cohomological equation for the second part. So that's the advantage of dealing with the infinite, infinitesimal problem. It's totally linear. So uh, I'm not going to explain how you solve this part, because it's easier. So I'm going to explain how you solve this, how you find a vector field that solves the cohomological equation for this initial data. So uh, how you do that, so let me skip this part, blah, 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 blah. OK. So um, the, the point is that this is a very simple dynamical uh, vector. It's just x times some constant. And you can prove that because the orbit of v is bounded by the Helmholtz operator, the sequence of Cn's are, does not grow, but uh, may grow, but does not grow too fast. The consecutive terms has a bounded distance. So the idea is to define alpha 2 uh, in this way, some x times something that depends only on the modulus of x. So it's something like uh, this. So you define uh, psi has Cn in this disk, in this ring, and Cn plus 1 in the next ring and Cn plus 2 in the next one, and so on and so forth. And you do some kind of a linear interpolation uh, between them. So you define, using a linear interpolation, you, you glue these things. So when you glue these things, you get a map like this. And because of this, uh, consecutive terms in this sequence is, uh, the distance is bounded. And the sequence of uh, points where you do the interpolation are converging exponentially to zero. You can prove that this is a quasi-conformal vector field. So this is like, uh, so that's a little of analysis, but it's a, a classical thing that we know that if you pick z log of modulus of z, this is a quasi-conformal vector field. So uh, it's quite similar to this setting. So uh, you prove this. You prove that this alpha 2 satisfies the problem in the frontier of the domains, and then use the infinitesimal pullback argument to extend everywhere. OK, okay. it's a little technical, but I uh, wanted to explain this. So um, OK, so you, you prove that this is bounded, and blah, blah, blah. Good. So uh, why this proof is nice? First, the proof is mostly infinitesimal. You never actually. Uh, need to deal with the, most of the time, we don't need to deal with the no linear helicization operator. We just deal with the derivative of the operator. And that's nice. The second uh, thing that I think is nice is that Sakari cell doesn't use complex dynamics. So you're not using the fact that the helicization operator is a complex dynamic map. You're just using that uh, uh, some smooth uh, dynamical system in infinite dimensional setting. You don't use complex dynamics in this part. And uh, the step uh, three and four, actually, you don't use two to prove that for a generic family, the intersection with the stable lamination has zero bag measure. You don't, don't use complex dynamics to prove that. It's just smooth dynamics, OK? And uh, the, the next step is that the proof of the key lemma doesn't use critical points. The critical points disappear. You have just a conformal iterative dynamical system there. Complicated one, but with no critical points. And the last uh, thing that I think is interesting is that it's a kind of linear version 
of the original Liebich proof in the unimodal setting. In the unimodal setting, Liebich uses what's called a small orbits theorem that uh, allows him to prove the hyperbolicity of a transition period. So this is kind of a linear version of the, the original Liebich argument. Okay, so I think it's just that. Thank you very much for your attention.